It's about time for us to get started this morning. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out. Good crowd. Good crowd this morning. We are so glad that you are with us. I know we have some visitors with us this morning. Thank you for your attendance. You're always welcome here at our congregation. If you're watching the live stream right now, we're glad that you're with us in that way. Um, a few announcements I need to make before we start. Tomorrow, these things happen tomorrow. Uh, Michelle Bice goes into Park Ridge for hip replacement, probably be in the hospital a few days. She's hoping that she can do her rehab at home. Prayers for Michelle. Miss Nancy Dennis also going into the hospital tomorrow for an inpatient treatment uh, for the cancer that is in her body. Uh, prayers for Miss Nancy and her family. And along those same lines, Sheila Rankin is also uh, undergoing radiation right now. At this time, another scan after after uh, this round of radiation to see how things are going. Prayers for all of those ladies. Uh, Leighton Jane Boynton is in the hospital in Atlanta right now. They're going to try the chemo. Uh, just, just a little bitty child, Leighton Jane and her family, uh, much, much in need of prayers. They'll start that on Friday. And David McAnally is here after surgery earlier this week. Good to see that David is earlier this past week, I, sh I should say. David is, is uh, doing well. Monday night for the Master is tomorrow night here at the building. There's a sign up in the foyer for that. Next senior eat out is Thursday down at the Western Sizzling in Jasper. The bus is going if you need a ride down there. Fall Creek Falls Retreat starts Friday night out at the park. There's a sign up in the foyer for that. Uh, they would like to have some snacks those sort of things to carry out with them. The wedding for Grace and Dakota is the 17th. That's here at the building at 1 o'clock. And my wife asked me to mention next Sunday when we have our regular monthly meetings, ladies, you are doing cookies for the shut-ins, and so that'll be next Sunday night. She wanted me to remind you of that. Birthdays this week, Jerry Triplett and Grace Ferguson both have birthdays on the 6th. Brad Pendergrass has a birthday on the 8th, and Sarah Land has a birthday on the 10th. And Scott asked me to mention that him and Beth have their 30th anniversary tomorrow. Happy anniversary to them. This morning, Willie Mosley is our song leader. Clarence May will be leading us in prayer. Bobby Lloyd will be presiding at the Lord's table, serving Aaron Lloyd, John Lloyd, Ethan Lloyd, and Ben Lloyd, and Tim Peters. And then Marvin Smith will lead the closing prayer. Number two.
Number 15. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for giving us another beautiful day to come out and worship you and sing praises unto you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with all the ones that are going to have procedures this week, that you'll watch over them and be with the doctors that they can do what is needed to help them in the best way if it be your will. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us and be with our youth as they do the retreat this next week and at Fall Creek Falls and as we go to CYC at the end of the month, that you'll watch over them and keep them safe during the travels and that something will be said to, to bring them closer to you, that the ones that are in attendance can learn from you and, and be a better example for the world to bring people to you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with our leaders of our country, that they will turn to you to, to get direction and, and turn, and the world will, will turn back to following you instead of 
the worldly ways. Heavenly Father, as we go through this service, we ask that we do everything in accordance to thy will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, so glad that the, uh, what was it, the groundhog didn't see his shadow, and that means we have six more, or no, no, we, but we got an early spring, right? <laughs> and it feels like that today, uh, and uh, that's such a blessing. Oh, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a terrible feeling uh, to realize when someone has stolen from you. Uh, I can remember a few years ago, I had someone, I had this old Jeep Wrangler, and I had somebody break into it, steal a pair of sunglasses and, and some other things. Uh, it wasn't a very good feeling to come out and see my Jeep. Uh, the door was ripped open and my stuff was thrown out everywhere, and my sunglasses were gone. Not, not, not a very good feeling at all. And I can imagine you have had maybe a, a similar experience. However, one, one good thing about a thief is that most often a thief is only going to steal from you once. Uh, that thief that came to steal my sunglasses, uh, he, he didn't have enough courage to come back <laughs> and keep taking from me. However, there are thieves in this world that are not so gracious. There are thieves that will steal from you that will rob from you continually, over and over and over again. The thief of anxiety. The thief of bitterness, perhaps. The thief of hatred and anger. Maybe even the thief of depression. 
the thief of loneliness, and maybe even the thief of grief. And things such as these will rob you of peace and joy over and over and over again. I think it's a truth uh, while living in the Christian life that uh, some, sometimes uh, we, we find ourselves in uh, certain states where peace and joy are absent. And, and I believe in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul helps us with times such as those. And that's where we're going to be this morning in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4 through 9. And what we'll find there, Paul doesn't give us a, um, or, or, or rather, Paul doesn't minimize our problems in, in the slightest. Uh, giving us some kind of superficial fix that's not going to that's not going to fix the the real issue. Paul is real here. Um, he's real about our problems. He recognizes that life is in existence and living in this fallen world. Uh, we are we are living um, in a time where we we might not feel peace and joy, and those things might be might be robbed from us. He knows that, and he's aware of that. But at the same time. When we face those times, those states, those conditions where we are without peace and without joy, He does give us some things to think about. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Look with me in the latter part of verse 8 and in verse 9. We're going to read this verse and then back up and look at verse 4 and take a journey together through the passage. Notice with me what Paul says. He says, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul says to us, he encourages us while living in this fallen world, he says, think about these things. Paul doesn't give us a quick, easy patch to put on our problems. He doesn't give us a quick and easy fix. Uh, that's, not what, that's not what this is. But he does give us the pathway. The pathway. He reveals to us the pathway of experiencing peace and joy in the existence of, of God. A, a kind of peace that's not of this world. Uh, we'll see within the lesson text that it's a peace, that a kind of supernatural peace almost. It's a, it's a strange kind of peace that surpasses the mind's ability to fathom. The very peace of God from the God of peace who surrounds His people with His peaceful presence. Paul tells us to think about these things and helps us, shows us, reveals to us the pathway to that peace that surpasses all understanding. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Some things to think about. Look with me in verse 4, if you will, of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. I remember my dad working with me when I was probably four or five years old, memorizing this, this passage. Um, and this, this is just a passage that comes to my mind quite often. Rejoice, Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'm going to say it. Again, rejoice. Now, I want you to focus with me on, the, on this word rejoice here. Uh, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to this. In, 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 in the, we don't really see this in, in English, but in the original language, in the Greek verb tense, this is in the imperative verb tense. I don't expect you to remember that. But that's just to say that uh, what the imperative verb tense is, is that it is, a, it is someone telling someone else to do something. It is, in essence, a command. I am commanding you to do this. This is an imperative. And then that's what this is. So what Paul is telling us, what Paul is telling the church at Philippi, and what Paul is telling us today is to rejoice. He's telling us to rejoice. He's commanding us to rejoice. 
Maybe you haven't thought about it that way before. That joy in the Christian life, rejoicing, Paul isn't making this optional. Rejoicing in the Christian existence is a command. And we see that. Paul reiterates it again within the passage. He says, again, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it till I'm blue in the face. Again, I will say rejoice. Something that's not optional in, in, in the Christian life. A command to rejoice. Now, that raises a question, I think. Um, since it's a command to rejoice, you know, isn't that kind of maybe inconsiderate to command somebody to have joy, to command somebody to rejoice? Because what if you don't feel joyful in the moment? Maybe you're in traffic uh, or, you know, maybe this might be a bad illustration for this area. <laughs> you might not hit as much. Maybe you go to Chattanooga or, or, you're, or you're going through uh, downtown Dunlap when school lets out or, or something like that. And there's all this traffic and it's, and it's frustrating, you know. You don't feel joy. How can you rejoice always in that kind of scenario? Or maybe you have kids, maybe you've taken your kids to Walmart, all three of them, and they, they decide to throw a temper tantrum all at the same time. Rejoice always? Really, Paul? Are you serious? Rejoice in the Lord always? Again, I'll say rejoice. Are you kidding me? That sounds kind of inconsiderate on a surface level reading, I think. And at the same time, another question that brings to mind... Wouldn't a command to rejoice be almost kind of cruel? What if the doctor comes in and says, yes, you have cancer or a disease such as that, or you face a life circumstance, a negative circumstance that's, that, that's comparable to that. Rejoice? For real? Are you kidding me? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. It sounds kind of inconsiderate on the surface, on the surface, doesn't it? It sounds maybe even cruel until you realize and see the basis for the command to rejoice. What is that basis? The basis for the command to rejoice is that our rejoicing as children of God is to be in the Lord. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. What does that mean? That means in all of the spiritual truths that have been uh, made valid to you in your Christian walk, and all of the promises that God has made, promises of life and healing and redemption and resurrection and intercession and, and, and blessings beyond the mind's ability to fathom in, in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is yours in the Lord. We have much to be thankful for. Um, all of these things applied to us as Christians. All of these truths, all of these promises that are, out, that are ours in Jesus Christ. Our promises that are in the Lord. If you look in Hebrews chapter 6, the Hebrew writer talks about all of the promises that God has made to you and wants you to be fully convinced that God will be faithful to His promises. And remember what the Hebrew writer says. He says that that hope that we have is a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul. An anchor is supposed to be an immovable object that's supposed to fix you on a certain spot so that you don't waver from side to side. Rejoice in the Lord and all of the spiritual truths, and all of the promises that have been made yours in Jesus Christ, and all of the promises that we have in God, as Paul tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians, are yes in Jesus Christ. So our rejoicing is to be in the Lord. 
And Paul, uh, he, he kind of uses himself almost as, as, an, as a living illustration of what this rejoicing in the Lord always looks like in, in, pra- in practice. If, if you've studied the book of, of Philippians before, you know uh, that the Apostle Paul, when he writes this book, uh, it, and, and the book of Philippians is a book about joy. <laughs> it's a book about the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. But what's so ironic is that Paul writes this book about joy in a place where he has nothing to be joyful about by earthly circumstances. Paul writes this uh, book probably from a Roman prison chained next to two praetorian guards with minimal food, with minimal water, with minimal care. No telling the kind of horrible conditions that he is living in. All because for the sake of Jesus Christ... He's imprisoned. He's in this horrible condition, this this negative circumstance. But yet the the whole irony of the book of Philippians is that he writes to the Philippians and not only writes them, but commands them to be joyful as he himself is joyful. And, And the point of that is that Paul, he believes that he has in Jesus Christ, what he has in a relationship with Jesus far outweighed the magnitude of any kind of negative circumstance that this fallen world could throw at him. That's why he rejoices in his negative circumstance. That's why he rejoices always in the Lord is because he firmly believes, he has this vision of God and the promises that God has made to him that, that, that are supreme in comparison to negative circumstances and trials and tribulations that he faces while on this world. If you wanted to take out a scale in Paul's mind, if you wanted to take out a, a scale and, and weigh negative circumstances with what he has in Jesus, by Paul's own words, it doesn't matter what, kind of negative circumstance that he faces, the scales would drop in favor of what he has in Jesus Christ every single time. So what, we, what, what can we learn from this? What, we, what can we learn from Paul? Paul helps us to see that, uh, not superficially, but in the Lord, in the Lord, we always have reason to rejoice despite circumstances. Uh, We sung the song, It is well with my soul uh, before. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, uh, whatever my lot, thou has taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. That's what it looks like. That's what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Understanding and realizing that what you have in Jesus Christ far outweighs the magnitude of the negative circumstance that you face in the present. That's the only way that you are enabled to rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And this kind of joy, this kind of rejoicing, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a personal choice. It's not necessarily just an initial feeling. It's a personal choice to react to life's circumstances with a disposition of faith. Um, And and it's hard to do this. It's it's hard to set our minds on the joyous truths of Christ, of all that He is, of all that He's He's done for us in the midst of negative circumstances. It it wasn't easy for Paul uh, by by, by any means. And, And sometimes we fail. But it's well worth it every single time when I say, you know, The scales are in the favor of what I have in the Lord versus whatever my negative circumstance is. And that's something, I believe, to think about. Uh, Let's continue on in our passage. Let's look at verse 5. Paul says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. That word reasonableness rendered in the ESV, it can also be translated as... Gentle. It can be translated as compassionate or kind or graceful. 
Um, in fact, it's, it's one of the qualifications that Paul lists for an overseer or an elder in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 3. And, and it's talking about one who has the capacity to lead with this kind of, uh, of disposition of tenderness and kindness. Uh, one who doesn't, uh, doesn't seek to cause conflict, uh, but one who genuinely and sincerely is gentle with people. And truly cares about others. And it's, it, it describes the kind of personality of Jesus Christ Himself. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, meek, and lowly. And heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It's the very disposition, it's the very attitude of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, let that, focus on that, be that person, and let that be known to everybody else around you. So what can we learn from this? What is, what is one of the things that Paul is saying? Paul is saying, and he's connecting this idea of gentleness to the peace that surpasses understanding later in the passage. Paul is one of the things that Paul is saying is that your attitude of gentleness, this attitude that you choose to cultivate in your life and your interactions with other people, the way you treat others with gentleness and kindness and sincerity and, uh, and have this reasonable spirit about yourself is directly connected to the peace you experience in life. When I choose to treat others in a Jesus-like way, it results eventually in peace and joy. Kind of like uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. You've seen the Christmas Carol before? Uh, there, uh, Charles Dickens in the early 1800s wrote uh, the famous novel, the, um, the, the Christmas Carol. And it's been done so many times in so many different ways uh, you, can, the, the, you can go down the list of the different movies that they've made about the Christmas Carol. My favorite growing up was the Muppets <laughs> Christmas Carol. I, I love that for, for some reason. Uh, but Ebenezer Scrooge, remember in that story, was someone who was this like stingy uh, n- person that wasn't kind in, um, in his dealings with others at all. But he had this like transformation through this vision, through this dream that he had, three spirits came, uh, came, came to him. And, and, and overnight, he has this change. He has this transformation of how he sees the world and how he sees other people. Um, he has this newfound purpose in his life to treat others with this kind of gentleness that we're talking about in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 5, this kind of compassion. And notice how, uh, notice the result in Scrooge's life. It resulted in peace and it resulted in joy. Brothers and sisters, that's an intentional picture by Charles Dickens himself of what the gospel is designed to do within the human heart. When the gospel takes hold of my heart and transforms my life and gives me this kind of new vision of God in other people, it helps me to become this person that was once stingy and viewed things as viewed life as being lived for myself. But now having this vision of people that I see them as immensely valuable and I see this God as worthy above all. And it helps me to become this gentle kind of person. That's the effect of the gospel in the heart, is that it creates us into this kind of reasonable, gentle, compassionate kind of people leading to peace, leading to joy. Allow the gospel, allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to take root in your heart See this Jesus who says, come to me. Look at my life. Look at how gentle and lowly I have, I have been in my relation to you. 
and allow that to change you into a reasonable person, a gentle person, a compassionate person. And when you do, that is directly linked to the peace, the unfathomable peace that surpasses understanding that will be yours as you continue in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Be a gentle person. Be a reasonable person. That's something, I think, to think about. Lastly, this morning, let's look at verse 6. Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There was a recent, recent statistic that came out a couple years ago. Uh, this, uh, this group surveyed 14 different countries and looked at how anxious the people living in these countries were. And guess who among the 14 countries was at the top of the list? America. Uh, coming in over Nigeria, coming in over Lebanon, all of the things that are happening in Lebanon right now, that's a uh, something that's another thing to, to think about. Com- coming in, America came in over uh, Ukraine as uh, one of the most anxious countries that there is. I uh, think it's safe to say, you know, uh, we might have a problem. We might have a problem with anxiety. So, well, what do we do with that? What do we do with that problem? I think King David helps us in Psalm 56, verse 3. Uh, David says something very telling and something very helpful uh, and something very gracious um, to those uh, of us who are anxious and struggle with such things. Psalm 56, 3, this is what David says. He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. I think that's intentional, and I don't think that's something that we should overlook. David, he doesn't say, if I'm afraid, or maybe if by some chance I am anxious um, and fearful about something in my life. No, that's not what he says. He says, when I am afraid. Fear and anxiety are inevitable. While living in this world, there's a lot to be afraid of. There's a lot to be anxious about. And, and David doesn't sugarcoat it. And he reveals it to us in his own existence, in his own experience. He says, when I am afraid. And David was afraid. He was afraid at things within his life. He was afraid. But when he was afraid, he did something about it. When I am afraid, I Put my trust in you. What we read in our passage in Philippians this morning is that when we are afraid, when anxiety comes, God doesn't leave us on a lonely island to fend for ourselves, to fight off uh, the, the, the demons on our own. God gives us weapons to fight the anxiety that comes within our life. Uh, notice, notice with me, Paul says, um, I'll, I'll read it again in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God doesn't leave us alone to fight anxiety and fear. He knows that this world is scary. He knows that there's a lot to be anxious while living in this fallen existence. And he gives us weapons to fight. Prayer, he mentions. Uh, And prayer isn't, you know, I'm not just saying, oh, just pray about it and and everything will be good. That's that's not what I'm saying and, and that's not what Paul is saying. Paul wants us to have this vision of prayer that is so much greater than just a bird's eye view. Just think about the basics of prayer. We as Christians have the capability now that we are in Jesus Christ to approach His throne of grace unhindered, un- unhindered, 
uninhibited. Uh, and God encourages us, the God of the universe that created the, the mighty celestial bodies and, and the, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven and, and the fish of the sea. Every kind of majesty that you see around you, the God that has that kind of, a, that, that kind of power and authority wants me to come into his presence as his child and communicate with him and plead with him and, 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 and talk with him. Prayer is amazing. <laughs> Just the very fact that we have the capability of talking to the God of the universe. And not only that, but the God of the universe says by his own words, he listens to us when we pray in a spirit of humility. And not only that, but He acts for us when we pray to Him. Prayer, think of prayer this way. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon to fight the fear that comes within your life, to fight the anxiety that comes over you when it comes over you, because it will fight it with a very potent weapon that God gives prayer. He also says supplication, very similar to prayer, but kind of carries a different nuance to it. It refers, Supplication refers to strong pleas and strong cries. Just read Psalm chapter 13 and see the kind of cries that David lifts up to God. David pours out his heart to God. Every, he, he lays it bare. Every kind of emotion and, and, and struggle and weakness and thing that he's dealing with, he opens it up and says, God, here it is. Here I am. Here is me. That's a supplication. And God wants you to do that. God wants you to lean on Him in that way. With a spirit of, number three, thanksgiving. We have much to be thankful for in a relationship with God, all kinds of things. Thank, thank, thanksgiving isn't just something that we do around Thanksgiving. It's something that we as Christians do continually because we have much reason to do so. And so Paul says that these three things, they're, they're prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, they're, they're not just superficial things. Um, they're powerful weapons that are intended to fight the fear and anxiety that come within our life, that's something, that's something pretty big to think about, that this God gives us the things that we need to live in Him, to fight the fear and anxiety that comes in our life. That's something to think about. And then he says this, this is the result of all of that that we've talked about, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The result of rejoicing in the Lord always, despite circumstances. The, the result of embracing the, the effect of the gospel, the effect that the gospel has on my heart. Gentleness and, 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 and walking with the Spirit and allowing Him to cultivate that in my life. The result of using your weapons that God has given to you, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, the result of all of that eventually is this kind of peace that can't be described, that can't be explained. And this peace, Paul says, guards your heart. It keeps your heart safe. It keeps your heart Secure. Oh, that, that, that's a human need, I think. Safety and security. We, we can't function if we don't feel safe. We can't operate as we are intended to if we don't feel secure. But the God of peace, who gives a peace that surpasses understanding when we submit to Him, gives us our need of safety and security as we submit to Him. And then lastly, Paul says this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about 
these things, everything that God is, all that He has, has, has given to you, everything that's good and pure and lovely that emanates from above, um, that we see through Jesus Christ, set your minds on those things and practice the things that you've seen within the life of the Apostle Paul and within the life of Jesus Christ. And the God of peace promises you a peace which is unfathomable, which cannot be explained, which cannot be understood to come to you. Think about these things. So Paul, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't promise us a life without problems. And that's not what I'm saying this morning. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, this is a quick fix to all of our struggles, to all of our, all of our problems that, he faces, that we face. But Paul does promise us in this passage a God who is much bigger than the problems that we face while living within this fallen world. And that's something very weighty to think about. This morning, if, uh, if anyone needs to respond to the gospel invitation uh, we plead with you, come forward and make, uh, make, the, make the need known that you need Jesus Christ in your life. Repent of your sins. Believe on Him. Confess faith in Him and be immersed in baptism. Also, if you, uh, if you're, if you are struggling with something um, and, and you would like for that to be made known so that a multitude of people can be praying for you and, and pleading to God on your behalf and, and, and helping you. We encourage you to come forward. And likewise, if, if, maybe if there's sin in your life, if, if you know you've done uh, things your way instead of God's way and you, and you need to make that known, this is a time uh, to, uh, to, make, to come forward and make that known if you need as we stand and as we sing.
We now have an opportunity to gather here around this table to partake of unleavened bread, which represents the body of Christ, of fruit of the vine representing his blood, to center our thoughts and our minds upon the great sacrifice, the great love that was shown toward us. Bow with me for prayer. Our God, our Father, we thank you for this bread which represents to us as Christians the body that Jesus freely allowed to be hung on the cross that we might have forgiveness of our sins. Be with us, Father, as we partake of this, that we may do so in a manner that is acceptable to you. For we pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Our Father, again, we thank you for this juice, the fruit of the vine. We thank you for your love, for allowing your Son to shed his blood on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sin. Help us, Father, to clear the thoughts of the world from our minds. Help us to concentrate on the love that you gave us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
as we think of the things that God has blessed us with, let's joyfully return a part of that. Pray with me, please. Our God, our Father, we, we thank you for the many blessings which you give us each day. Father, help us to look at those blessings and return a part of them that we may help in spreading your word to do good not only here in this community but throughout the world to teach your word, to help others. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attendance this morning. Good crowd we have out there. Appreciate Brother Keith's message. Uh, man, that peace, that peace we all we all need. We all need that peace. And this country needs peace, and the world needs peace. Uh, please come back with us 5:30 this evening. I believe Brother Bradley will be in the pulpit. Be excited to to hear him. Don't forget if you have personal items in the pew, please take them home with you. We are going to. Clean, uh, clean the pews um, in about two weeks on Saturday the 17th. We'll also have a wedding here. It'd be nice to have all the, ple- the pews cleaned up and uh, ready for them. If you're going to CYC with me next Sunday morning after the morning worship, please have a meeting with me. Come see me. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about transportation and things. And one more thing, I know I'm giving a bunch of announcements. Taylor was telling me the, uh, the young man that's a fifth grader at at Whitwell that had the, had the tumor removed, still waiting back on results on this. But he is one out of about 25 people in the United States that has this. I mean, that is just how rare that this is. And so they're trying to figure out the appropriate way to, to go after that. So please continue to keep him in prayers. We're going to sing number 705. 705. We'll sing it through one time. We'll have a closing prayer and then we'll sing happy birthday to those who have birthdays this week. Please stand with me. Let's all pray, please. Father, we're thankful 
tell you once again that we've had this time to come out here and sing these songs, study, and hear another portion of your word. We pray, Father, that everything we've done is right and acceptable in your sight. Father, we ask that you be with those that are mentioned in our bulletin, those that are going to the hospital and, and have work done. We pray that you will be with them, watch over them, make their pain a little, and return them to their home as soon as possible. Father, we're thankful for our soldiers, those that are fighting in wars at this very moment that you would watch over them and bring them home also. Now, we pray that you will be with us, watch over us, and care for us. Most of all, forgive us of our sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 